we mentioned, we introduced, and we'll just recap on the TCP SYN flooding attack, a distributed denial of service attack in that the attacker <coughs> needs to take control of many slave computers by infecting them with some other software, some malicious software. And once he has control of that, those slave computers, those slave computers perform a TCP SYN flooding attack. And how it works is that those slave computers send slave computers send TCP SYN segments to the target computer. So some server, for example, some web server. And there are many slaves. And they try to establish a connection to the server, as anyone would try to establish a connection to the server. Say it's a web server. And they establish a TCP connection by sending a SYN segment. What happens when the server receives a SYN segment? Two different responses. It either accepts the connection and sends back a SYN act. Uh, where does it send the SYNAC to is slightly different. And if it accepts the connection, the server in memory records some details about that connection. The source IP address, port number, that is who it came from, and other things about sequence numbers. So a little bit of memory is allocated for that connection that's about to start up. The source of this SYN segment has a fake IP address, or an incorrect IP address. So even though it comes from this computer, the source address is some address that does not correspond to this computer. It's very easy to change the source address. You can use something like IP tables to change the source address of packets that you send. It doesn't have to match yours. So if that happens, then the target receives it and responds to some, com some either unknown or computer that doesn't exist or some other computer on the internet that did not send the SYN segment. It will not come back to the attacker computer which means that this will not be overflowed with responses. It can keep sending. Uh, a, a small amount of memory is allocated for that. As attackers keep doing this, the server allocates more and more memory for each connection that accepts. Uh, it has a limit of the amount of memory that it can used to store connection information. Uh, if we fill up that memory, then no more connections can be accepted. So we have a problem, and that's our basic uh, denial of service attack. We send a lot of SYN segments such that the memory at the target server is exhausted. There's no more memory left for real hosts to connect to. So if this is a true host, these are the attacker hosts, this one tries to contact the web server. If there's no memory available to store information about the connection, this one will be rejected. And the way that it rejects is if it sends a reset message. So it denies service to the real users in this case. So this is an attack on the memory of the target server in this case. It's difficult to prevent. Uh, we said yesterday there's an approach called cookies, SYN cookies, that pre can prevent it or slow it down. But the problem with SYN cookies is that not everyone implements them. And in the reality in the internet, routers and some uh, firewalls, cache, caching servers uh, may, if they don't understand SYN cookies, that can cause other problems in the network. So using cookies to prevent this denial of service attack doesn't always work and causes other problems. So it's a modification to how TCP works normally. And if a computer doesn't understand how SYN cookies work, then 
that will cause problems for the, uh, the normal users. So it's very hard to prevent such a distributed de denial of service attack. Filter packets at routers. But you need to distinguish what are the real packets coming from normal users and what are the packets coming from the attackers. If you make a mistake, then again you're denying service to our normal users. One other example attack. Use ICMP. You know how ping works. You ping a computer, it sends an ICMP echo request to that computer, that computer responds with an echo response. That's ping. This attack takes advantage of that. Illustrated here. Again, the attacker takes control of some slaves. These computers on the left here. So it, again, somehow it needs to infect those so it can use or install software on those computers to initiate the attack. And what it gets these slaves to do is send a ping message, an echo request. So the messages from the slave computers to this set of what's called reflector machines are ICMP echo request messages. And they have fake source addresses. So what happens? A slave computer sends a ping request to some reflector machine with a fake source address such that the source address matches that of the target computer, whether it's a server or a router. In this example, it's a router. So what happens? This is a normal computer on the internet, the reflector. It receives a ping request. Source is the address of this computer. When you receive a ping request from someone, you respond with a ping reply. So the reflector sends a ping reply to this computer. And many attackers send many ping requests to many reflectors. All, those, all of those reflectors send the, send the ping reply, the ICMP echo reply, to the target. Overflows the network at the target. Not overflowing memory, but overflowing the network. For example, the router becomes congested. Or if it's a slow link, the link uh, uh, is full. So in this case, the slaves are controlled by the attacker. The attacker needs to get some malicious software on there to initiate the attack. But the reflectors are not. The reflector machines are just normal computers on the internet. When they receive an ICMP echo request, they respond. And because the source address is a fake address and it's the target router address, they respond to the target, overflowing the target. So an ICMP flooding attack or an ICMP uh, uh, ping attack. Slaves, attacker takes control of slave hosts. Each slave sends an ICMP echo message, a ping to a set of reflector hosts. They're normally random hosts. They are not under control of the attacker. Just normal computers or routers. They have a fake, the echo requests have a fake or a spoofed IP address for the source. And that value, that fake value is in fact the target's IP address. Therefore the reflectors send the ICMP response, the echo reply, to the target which is this fake source address. The target receives too many packets and overflows the, the router in this case. If the target is a, a server, then possibly the router that connects to that server could be overflowed. Depends where the bottleneck is. But the idea is to leave no network resources for normal users. Because all of the packets occupying the link are these ping packets. If you try to something, send something else, the router is busy trying to deal with these ping packets. And you, the router will not respond. How do you prevent such an attack? Do not respond to ICMP messages. Do not let them in. But that breaks the, some of the basic principles of the internet in that ICMP has a purpose. It's a purpose of testing uh, a network, testing a path. 
So if you prevent ICMP, you can no longer test your network. So that denials, denies some form of service as well. Or not respond to ICMP or to drop ICMP packets. Again, we, to prevent this attack, we prevent uh, we deny people from using ICMP in its normal and intended way, which is bad as well. So two examples of attacks. There are many other denial of service attacks. These are two simple ones, uh, ones that we understand the, the protocol mechanisms. We can generalize uh, the attacks and classify them based on two factors. What type of resource do they consume? We deny service by consuming a lot of resources. TCP SYN, we consumed memory. We overflowed the memory of the server. ICMP flooding attack, we overflowed the network resources, the router or the link resources. So generally, a di distributed denial of service attack either consumes computer resources, internal computer resources, CPU, memory, like the SYN flooding attack, or the network resources, the transmission capabilities of the network. If you send enough packets, then there's no space across the link to send other packets, the intended packets, like the ping. The other thing we see in those two different example attacks is the source of those attacks. In the TCP SYN flooding, it was a direct distributed denial of service attack. The attacker controls some slaves, or even a hierarchy of slaves, and those slaves under the control of the attacker directly attack the target. Go back to TCP SYN, the slaves, this set of four computers in the example, send the packets direct to the target. That's a direct distributed denial of service attack. In a reflector attack, the packets sent to the target are from normal hosts on the internet, not from hosts under the control of the attacker. They're from reflector machines. You see, the attacker controls just this set of hosts, the slaves. The slaves send the packets, and these normal computers that are not under control of the attacker reflect those packets to the target. Uh, and Many norm routers, hosts on the internet will respond to an ICMP echo request. So it reflects by default. So, so long as the protocol is such that they will respond, and in this case respond to the target, then it will work. So it requires the protocol to be able to be manipulated in that way, but with ICMP, if our ICT web server responds to ICMP packets, then it can be a reflector machine. If your home computer, or more specifically your home router, which is attached to the internet, responds to ICMP packets, it can be a reflector machine. Because the slave machine sends an echo request to your home router, the router responds. So that's easy, or easier to get many computers involved. The attacker only needs to control the slaves. The reflectors don't need to be infected with anything and controlled by the attacker. Yep. Yes. Yep. In the direct attack, there's just one group. The the slaves under control. In the reflector attack, there are two groups. There's the slaves under control of the attacker. It could be a hierarchy of slaves in both cases. That is, oh, I think we'll see on the next slide that. But still, the slaves are somehow infected by the attacker and under their control. That is, they will do what the attacker wants them to do. But in the reflector attack, the reflector machines are not under control of the attacker. What that means is it's easier to get more computers involved because the attacker needs to get access to the slaves. It needs to infect them. How do you infect other computers? Well, you look for bugs or vulnerabilities in those computers using other malicious software. That's hard. 
or is not trivial. But to get computers that are not infected to send packets is easy with a number of protocols. So you can get more reflectors than slaves. And the more you have in a distributed denial of service attack, the more effective the attack is. Yep. Uh, so in this case, let's say we only we have four slaves and we have thousands of reflector machines. In theory, we could send packets from those four slaves to many different reflectors and they reflect to the target. The problem arises if you don't have many slaves, just four in this case, they need to send a lot of packets first, the, the slaves do. With a thousand reflectors, they need to send 250 packets for every one they they want the reflector to send. And if we can trace back to these, then if we can just shut down two of them, we've shut down half of the network. If we had a hundred slaves and we could quickly trace back and find the, the source and shut down two of them, there's still 98 running. And potentially we could infect others as those two are shut down. So the more slaves you have, the better. The more reflectors you have, the better. But generally, it's easier to get reflectors than slaves. So a reflector distributed denial of service attack is generally better than a direct attack. Better because we can get more packets being sent to the target. And better because it's harder to trace back. One of the ways to uh, respond to denial of service attacks, even if you cannot prevent it, if you can trace back and find out who did it, then you can take other measures to prevent it in the future. Legal measures and so on. But if you have the attack coming from just anyone's home computer, then it's harder to trace back who the original source is. These these two diagrams illustrate those two t general type of attacks. The slaves are referred to as zombies. This shows a direct attack, but it shows a hierarchy of slaves or zombies. Zombies in that there are computers that are under control, these are the computers under control of the attacker, have been infected somehow. In this hierarchy, the attacker takes control of some master zombies, infects them with some software, where that software then goes and looks for other computers and infects them, the next layer down in the hierarchy. So this master zombie tries to infect other computers on the internet and takes control of them. And in fact, you can have a different levels in the hierarchy. The more levels, the better, because it's harder to trace back to the original attacker. And the more you can get involved. So a direct attack, Still, the slaves are under control of the attacker, directly attack the victim. Reflector attack. Same, same number of master and slave zombies. Attacker has control of the first three master zombies and the next six slave zombies. But then they all send to the many different reflectors. And the reflectors all send to the victim. So. You look at this uh, slave zombie, it sends to many different reflectors and that triggers the reflectors to send many packets to the victim, although it doesn't show many here, there, uh, there's just one arrow per reflector, it would be many packets coming from each re reflector to the victim, causing more traffic coming to the victim. So for, for example, the ping attack uses this approach, but others do as well, it doesn't have to be be the ping attack. This is better in terms of you can get more nodes involved. It's harder to trace back to the attacker. What's the disadvantage compared to direct attack? So this is better in terms of more nodes, that's better for an attack, and harder to trace back because there's 
more steps from the victim to the attacker, and in particular steps involve just normal computers, what's the disadvantage of this approach? Sorry? Not, uh, yeah, we have to control many computers, but it's all automated. It's just one person sitting here. The software controls them. That's not a problem. Uh, it may not be effective if all right, if the reflectors do not respond to ICMP, more generally, for this to work, we need a protocol. We need to take advantage of a protocol that these reflectors will respond with, like ICMP. So uh, the difficulty about this is that you need to take advantage of a protocol that will allow these normal reflectors to actually reflect. ICMP is one example, but what other protocols? If we try HTTP, send a GET request to here and get this to send the HTTP response to here. That will only work if this is a web server. But there are not so many web servers compared to normal hosts. So that is, there are less protocols that we can take advantage in this case. Because we need these to, these reflectors to respond to the to the victim. What's the, the opposite. That is the advantage of reflector, the more we can get more nodes involved. That's good because it means more traffic directed at the victim. We have further separation from the victim to, to the attacker. That's good because it's harder to trace who the attacker is. And the disadvantage is that we need a specific protocol that hosts on the internet will respond with. ICMP is one, HTTP is normally not a good one. Therefore, direct is usually the opposite. That is, all right, there are less nodes involved. That's a disadvantage. You're closer to the victim. That's a disadvantage. But easy, uh, but yeah, so easier to trace back. The advantage is that we we have control of the slaves. That is, we can send a GET request to here and make this act as a web server and send to here because the attacker has control there. So there are more protocols we could utilize in this case. Many attacks nowadays would be reflector attacks. What's remaining? Any other questions on these two? Yeah. Uh, the, the, these, these two diagrams are very general. Uh, oh well, maybe not general. Very uh, simple examples. Why, why did this, this computer contact these two? For no reason. It could have contacted these three or these four. It's just showing the concept that one attacker takes control of multiple masters and then each master zombie takes control of multiple slave zombies. How many? Well, as many as possible. Which ones? Whichever ones we can take control of. So it's just showing the concept of this. And you can have a more levels in the hierarchy. Instead of so, one set of zombies take a control of others and others and others, and you get a botnet. And you've heard of botnets. A botnet is effectively all the uh, zombies under control of some original user, some attacker. So many of the attacks. Dis distributed denial of service attacks uh, come from what's referred to as botnets, which are a network of uh, computers which are controlled by some attacker to do whatever the attacker programs them to do. 
So these set of zombies is referred to as a botnet. And people talk about millions of computers in terms of the size of some botnets. That is, one person has control of hundreds of thousands of different computers. So one net actor needs to control all the zombies. Sorry? One net actor needs to control all the zombies. Why? Because the zombies, I think, they cannot control. Uh, it's about getting as many as possible under, under the attacker's control. Yes. But so by control, it means getting software on those computers that will do what the attacker wants it to do, depending on what they want to uh, uh, achieve. Um, well, yeah, AI is just some, 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 some software with some algorithms to uh, adapt. So, yes, if you can program them to automatically go and look for other zombies, to adapt the, the to handle different attacks, and that's even better. If you put a program in a, in a folder that everyone yeah in a shared shared folder, uh, yeah, that yeah, but the, yeah, if you send something like the. Uh, was it the Melissa or the yeah the Melissa virus was sent on a mailing list? Then it requires on people opening that so virus. The mailing, <laughs> <laughs> the mailing list that we have removes executable files, so good software will remove. Uh, you, the one you get that that's not uh, is that a virus? That's, that's not a virus. That's different malicious software. That's... Uh, I think two years ago, someone, someone did... Um, some, actually, not in senior project, in a, in a uh, course on... I can't remember, an elective, a technical elective, I think two years ago, someone tried the TCP SYN attack. I remember some students. So they got some computers and programmed it to do the sin attack. So, no, it was within the lab. They were allowed to do that. <laughs> I think. Okay, so the attacker needs to con construct their network the network of zombies. They need slaves. So to do that, they need to infect these host computers with some software, some zombie software. And that software needs to be able to perform the attacks. So depending upon the attack that they choose, they need to get some software onto some hosts that will start the attack, like send the TCP SINs or the ICMP packets. Uh, to be to cover a larger number of computers to get as many as possible, it should be able to run on different operating systems, different hardware platforms, so that you can infect not just Windows computers but Macintosh, Linux computers, and so on. The more, the better, from the attacker's perspective. Also, the software that's on those zombie computers, on the slaves, should be hidden, so that the normal user who's sitting at the computer doesn't notice it being there. So hidden in terms of uh, on the file system, hidden in terms of its operations, so that the user who's using their computer doesn't know that it's actually sending ICMP packets to some target. And should be able to be contacted by the attacker to trigger the attack. That is, the attacker gets some zombie software on these computers. Sometime later, they need to send a command to them, start the attack. And what botnets do, these hundreds of thousands of computers have been infected and they're just sitting there in some cases ready for someone to pay the attacker a lot of money to initiate the attack, depending upon their, their needs. 
So the attacker needs to be able to contact and trigger the attack. Yeah, uh, disabling your internet connection yeah. makes attacks and, and d if you just un do not have internet all your life, you'll be safe from such, <laughs> such security but problems. If we don't, be, uh, don't want to be a zombie, so if we connect internet all the time, maybe if we are, we, uh, maybe be a target. Yes, yes, so I if your internet connection is disconnected, then at least the attacker, if you're infected, cannot trigger the attack. But if you disconnect simply via software, then maybe the software can reconnect. So you need to be careful how you disconnect. Of course, disconnecting is not very uh, convenient for most users if you want internet access. To get this zombie software on these computers, of course, we need to take advantage of some other uh, bug or vulnerability in those systems. Some bug in the operating system, in the browser, or some software on the computers. To find vulnerable machines, you use different scanning approaches. So scan through the internet looking for computers that have the software that have the bugs. Computers running the software of the versions which have known bugs, which the attacker can take advantage of. or not just bugs, weaknesses. For example, secure shell servers that have weak passwords, especially root passwords. Let's say the IT server. If someone can, out on the internet, if it allows access to the root account, and someone on the internet can guess the root password, then they can access the IT server and take control of that. Do what they like, for example, put zombie software on there, and then use it later in attack. So it's not just bugs that they can take advantage of, but uh, weaknesses in, in the security of, say, passwords and login mechanisms. If you look at, a, say, the IT server, then without any special software, it will receive hundreds, if not thousands, of requests a day from people on the internet trying to log in, trying to break the security of the server. And that's not a very popular server. How do you prevent all these attacks? One of the comments yesterday, have another server, have a backup server. So if your server is under attack, you can switch over to a backup server. Of course, that means more resources, more cost involved. You can make sure the protocols are not vulnerable to such attacks. But that's not easy because the protocols are like ICMP, TCP are built that way for a specific purpose. Aim to provide some service when, even when you're under a, an attack by having backup resources, by having extra resources. Or reverting back to a very simple service. Be able to detect the attacks quickly. Even if you cannot prevent, if you can detect the attack, you may be able to respond. Start blocking traffic. Switch to a backup site. So take responses that will uh, alleviate the, the harm. Detect by looking for suspicious patterns of traffic. So monitoring traffic uh, and seeing if something's suspicious so that possibly the attack is about to start and you can cut it off before it has a major impact. And respond. If you can detect, try to find the attacker and apply technical means blocking their network from sending packets to you, and eventually legal means of, of responding. So even though if you cannot prevent an attack, you may be able to prevent future attacks if you can respond. And that finishes our course for the semester. Time for questions. First questions on this topic. Any questions on distributed denial of service attacks? So 
We've gone through, you should know the basics of the TCP SYN flooding attack, the ICMP flooding attack, uh, and the difference between a direct and a reflector attack. If you look in past exams, you see sometimes there's a, a picture of one of those attacks and you have to explain how it works. <laughs>